Hey, welcome to all of you. And uh, some of our folks are actually out of town, so we have uh, less people here, but that's okay. Um, we're going to worship together, and um, I pray that you will uh, open the Bible and uh, turn to uh, uh, the book of Proverbs, and we're going to think about what it means to be a father. Today is Father's Day, right? Um, yeah, happy Father's Day to all the fathers here. Okay, that's me. <laughs> and then uh, soon to be father, uh, happy Father's Day. Um, I want to start with a question. What do you think of when you see this word? Father. Father. Uh, what kind of image do you have in mind? Do you think of, you know, father, fatherhood? Do you think of uh, courage, loyalty, faithfulness, responsibilities? Loyalty, um, wisdom, perhaps. Do you think of that? Those those terms. You do. All right. Uh, but most of the time, I think, um, sadly, we are in the crisis of fatherhood, and um, you know, absentee father. Probably you can think of that when you see father, or think about father, abusive father, detached father, or angry father. <laughs> I don't know what you think of, you know, uh, especially in the Asian context. Uh, sometimes we think of all sorts of, you know, negative images uh, related to, uh, to, to fatherhood. Uh, according to some of the numbers, uh, 24, million, 24 million children in the United States, they grow up without a biological father. So that's three, one in three, right? That's a pretty big number, right? Uh, one out of three children, you know, growing up without a biological dad in their home. That is the crisis of father, fatherhood, and that leads to us all sorts of different crises about your personal development, about our personal identity, about how we anchor uh, 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 who we are uh, with our fathers. So that's a, a huge crisis. And... Um, that's why we need to talk about this, okay? Today is Father's Day, and I would like to uh, think a little bit more about what it means to be a father. And hopefully this will not be applicable only to fathers, but to all of us. Uh, think of the fathers in the Bible. Any negative examples in the Bible? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They are not colorful or beautiful figures most of the time. They have their own weaknesses and brokenness, right? Think of, you know, Jacob, right? He, uh, he favored one of his sons, right? Uh, Joseph, and brings about some sort of family emergency or family crisis. He almost breaks apart, you know, the entire family because of his uh, favoritism on Joseph. Destroying the family of God. You know, if without the grace of God, at the end of the book of Genesis, the family cannot be safe, right? Um, so, negative image of father. And then, uh, probably you can think of some positive image of the father from the Bible, right? Joseph, New Testament. Jesus, earthly father, right? Being described as righteous, right? Obedient uh, to Torah. Father Abraham, again, uh, he believed in God, and God credited him righteousness, right? He trusted in God. So there's some mixed complexity, you know, with all the fathers in the Bible. Um, but I think this is good news. The good news is that, you know, you know even with our own brokenness, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody's father, and I struggle with my own witnesses, I struggle with my um, uh, you know, all sorts of things, uh, brokenness, in order to, uh, to be a father, uh, try to be a father uh, that is uh, pleasing uh, to, uh, to God. And I think this is good news when we see, you know, all sorts of different positive fathers or negative fathers in the Bible. And the grace of God is always sufficient. It's always abundant. And um, only if we have the courage only if we have the humility uh, to come before God to, uh, to, uh, to be shaped by uh, the grace of God. So today, I hope the message will not be just applicable to the fathers, 
but uh, to all of us. Now, if you turn to your Bible, in the middle part of the Bible, there are five books. Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Son, uh, Song, Song of Songs. These five books, uh, what we call together, is the body of literature. We call them wisdom literature. Wisdom literature. And um, each of these books has, has its own way to show the life of wisdom. What does it mean to live wisely? And um, uh, in the context of uh, today, uh, father is often teaching the son, like in the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, teaching the son and the daughter how to behave, how to live a life of wisdom. So there we go. Uh, we have a huge body of literature in the, right in the middle of the Bible showing us what it means to, be, uh, to, to, to live a life of wisdom. Will you consider yourself wise? How many of you would consider yourself, I have some wisdom? You know, how many of you? All right, you guys are very humble. And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, this is, this is interesting about uh, 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 wisdom literature in the Bible. You know, wisdom literature, if you read carefully, if you think about it carefully, it, it is different from all other different uh, writings of the Bible like the prophetical books. Uh, some other uh, uh, writings are, are written in such a way that, you know, truth come, comes from above. Thus says the Lord, right? The prophet said. Thus says the Lord, this is what Yahweh said. So you have to obey, right? Wisdom literature is a little bit different. Actually, in terms of direction, wisdom literature from below. It's all, it, it, it often uh, gives us uh, uh, some sort of, uh, you know, from observation to insight. So the wise, uh, the wise teacher in the book of Proverbs, for example, he moves from observation to truth. He observes there's a divine order in the world. Of course, the universe is uh, complex and just you know, finely tuned. It's amazing. But the wise teacher moves a little bit forward and says not only the universe is designed and created by God, and it's amazing by itself, he perceives there's an order in the universe. And that order is not just a physical order, but a moral order, a spiritual order. And that spiritual order he perceives and he observes, and then he he, uh, he, he got some insights and spiritual insights and lessons uh, to uh, how to live a godly life. That is what wisdom is all about. Wisdom in the biblical sense is practical skill, how to live a beautiful life, how to live a life, a godly life that is pleasing to God. That is wisdom in the Bible. So because you guys are all wise, uh, I want to give you some uh, questions, okay? So I'll give you a picture and you tell me what kind of insight you can get out of it. All right, you ready? All right, let me show you this. So when you see something like this, okay, when you see something like this, what kind of, what kind of insight can you get? Where, where, where you see those, those, this picture? Home Depot, all right? A door hinge, right? A door hinge. What kind of practical wisdom can you get out of it? Right? It's kind of strange, right? Why you show me this picture on the worship? And, um, <laughs> right? Uh, what do you see? You know, the wise teacher will come and, and observe something and how the door hinge works. And he would understand the order of life. You know, spiritual lesson, so-called. Let me show you. Proverbs 26, 14. As the door swing back and forth on his hinges, so the lazy guy turns over in the bed, right? That's what he's getting at, right? From observation to truth, remember? From observation to insight. From observation of how the world works. And then he gets some spiritual lesson that is applicable to all of us. You gotta work hard. Otherwise, you will be like a hinge, moving left and right, and you are not moving anywhere and your life will not be uh, contributing to the community. 
that's what uh, the wise is getting at, right? So from observation to, to truth, okay? You get, you get what it means, right? You get, you get what I mean. So uh, I'll give you a second picture, and then you tell me what kind of insights or spiritual lessons you can get, okay? Now this second picture I took uh, two weeks ago, and I was in Israel, and as you know, I, I, I was leading about 27 people uh, for two weeks uh, in Israel. So we were in Bethlehem. And as you know, we, we tour around you know, the country, and, and sometimes we need to do shopping, okay? We need to do shopping. So we were in a shop, and uh, it, it was uh, owned by a Palestinian Christian family. And we spent a little bit of time in there, and they got some souvenirs, uh, some olive wood uh, craft, you know, all sorts of things. And, um, you know, don't ask me, I didn't buy anything for you. Um, but, you know, they, they, they all bought something, right? So by the time I, I, I told the group, okay, we gotta go, right? We gotta go, the time's getting late. You know, we need to move on to the next stop, right? So every, everyone is uh, ex exiting the shop and ready to get onto the bus, right? And then right at that moment, a, a street merchant, you know, ambushed us and came with some, some sort of, pro, uh, some sort of uh, you know, souvenir items and trying to sell those to uh, some of the people who got extra money. Um, so that delayed us um, from getting onto the bus. So right there, I was uh, trying to tell them, you know, we gotta go, we gotta go, you know, uh, you know, run out of time. And then I took this picture. <laughs> so they were on the ground, they were on the ground with all this scarf and, you know, uh, textile products. Um, and then uh, bookmarks, you know, fairly cheap. And I think the merchant, uh, you know, got, got some of our weaknesses. You know, he, he's like, oh, I'm gonna sell you, like, you know, it was originally $10 for five, and then now it's $5 for five, okay? And then all this, you know, team members, as you know, <laughs> they, uh, they got delayed, you know? We, we, we actually, we are frozen in time. And then, <laughs> And then they are trying to get all of these things. Uh, it's actually very nice. It's very, very nice. It's just not, um, it's just not, not me. Um, so, so this is the picture I took, okay? So from observation to truth, what kind of insight did you get? Immediately, I thought of one verse in the Bible that talks about this picture. Exactly, right? It's this one. 2014 Proverbs. The buyer heckles over the price saying, it's worthless, it's worthless. Then, brag about getting a bargain. So the wise teacher is making some observations about human nature. He's trying to describe human nature, right? What is the human nature that he describes? He observes humanity. We are all beings of contradiction, right? When they were looking for the different colors of textile products, this is not good, this is not good, this is not good, this is not good, you know? And, uh, you know, by the way, it's not just ladies, you know, men too. Yeah, this is not good, this is not good, this is not worthless, you know? They try to heckle the price, right? And then after they got it, they got onto the bus, they say, oh, this is so good. This is so nice. <laughs> now, what the, uh, what, the, uh, what the Book of Proverbs is trying to get at is that we tend to be prideful. We tend to, be, to be, be proud. That's our natural tendency. Our natural tendency has, has always not be humility. You don't have to work on yourself. You don't have to work hard in order to be a prideful person. You are a prideful person, right? And that's why our inner self is often contradicting um, uh, um, uh, ourselves. So that, that is what the, the, the wise teacher is trying to do. From observation on earth, and then he gets some spiritual lesson to understand who we are and understand the way of wisdom. So there are two big points I want to um, I want to show you. First is biblical wisdom is understanding the order of creation. There is a certain order, spiritual order, moral order in this universe. And the wise teacher, the wisdom literature is trying to get at is to observe carefully and then get some spiritual lessons out of it. 
And the second point is, which is important, is that wisdom begins with obeying the voice of God. So let me, let me show you uh, the first point. Understanding the creational order of God. I'll show you this picture. What do you see here? Stone fallen, right? Stone fallen wall. It's very simple, right? And what do you get? Again, observation to insight, right? 2430. Here the teacher says, I walk by the field of a lazy person, the vineyard of one with no common sense. I saw that it was overgrown with all sorts of nasty weeds and the walls were broken down. And then I look and then I reflect upon it and I learn this spiritual lesson. A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little more folding of hands to rest, then poverty will come. It will pound on you like a bandit. It will come to you and attack you like an armed robber. So that's, that's what he's trying to get at. If you slumber a little bit more, if you're lazy a little bit more, you should know that life always works this way. That is the principle of life. He passes by a lazy person's vineyard. You know how many years uh, do you need to grow a mature vineyard? How many years of hard work? Well, six years. <laughs> 20 years it would be a very mature, very mature, very valuable. You know, you go to a wine store, you get, you get some good wine. Those are from a very, very old, a very, very mature grown uh, vineyard. But uh, what I'm telling you is at least six years, 24-7, 365 days a year. You have to work on the soil, you have to work on the, the wall, and you have to retain the soil, the good soil, and then you have to fertilize it, you have to water it, take care of it, prune it, and grow it for six years of sweat and labor. And then you get a vineyard. But if the vineyard is in the lazy person's hand, the vineyard will be ruined. Uh, you'll find weeds. You'll find your vineyard being destroyed, just naturally being destroyed. Doesn't mean there's an enemy trying to attack it, trying to uh, break down the walls. It's just naturally, stone will always fall down. Stone from the stone wall will always fall down and the, and the wall will be broken and you lose all the soil and all your produce. So the wise teacher is a spiritual teacher. He's not a, he's not a natural scientist. He observes how the world works and he learned a lesson. If you're a little bit lazy in your spiritual life, in your relationship with God, if you stop working, there's always forces of chaos that will destroy you. That is the natural order of things. And the order will naturally give way to chaos. The wise teacher is saying, in your life, this has always been this way, order to chaos. Always order to chaos, unless you work hard and you work against the forces of darkness, forces of chaos. You put the fallen stone back on the wall. You input, you work and you labor, you sweat, repair and maintain your life. Otherwise, you will not enjoy the fruit of your labor. Spiritual life or life in general does not come easy. That's what wisdom is trying to say to you. Um, there's always an a, a insistence of emphasis of diligence. You know, wisdom does not come easily. It can only be earned. It can only be earned by your hard work. Spiritual maturity, character formation. You want to be like Christ. You want to be uh, making advances in your spiritual journey. It doesn't come naturally. What comes naturally is ruin, chaos. If you fold your hands, fold your arms, you know, naturally, you will be destroyed. And the wise person is saying, you know, you need to put sweats and tears into your spiritual life. 
you know, think about it. I've been a Christian for a long time, right? Whenever I got lazy, I don't do anything about it, right? I don't work against my own weaknesses, my own self, old self. All sorts of sinful nature will come out, right? You have to guard your heart. In, in fact, the Old Testament and New Testament, the entire Bible often advises and command us to guard our heart. And guarding is a military term. It's a military term. You stand on the tower to guard against the enemies. They will come anytime to destroy you, and your life will be ruined. And you have to guard your own life. And how do you do that? That is wisdom calling. Calling you to form your character, to mold yourself so that you are on the right track in your spiritual relationship with God. So wisdom is understanding the creational order, and then you learn some spiritual insight out of it, right? For those of you who have the blessing to be born and to grow up in a, a Christian environment, I want to tell you, you know, you cannot take it for granted because the forces of darkness will destroy you. It will ruin you unless you work really, really hard. That is Proverbs 24. So second point is, wisdom is listening and obeying God. Now, don't get me wrong. Wisdom literature is not about self-help, self-improvement. It's about drawing us closer to God himself. So Proverbs 19.27, it says, If you stop listening to discipline, my child, you will stray from the words of wisdom, words of knowledge. Words of discipline, think about it. The Hebrew word means, actually it can, means, it can, it can mean chains, you know, boundaries. Something you can think of, uh, it's not something, it's not some comforting words. Words of discipline. Um, it's it's going to be tough to listen to, but you have to listen to it. You have to be obedient. You have to be open to discipline. Straight. It means unable to walk in a straight line, you know. Have you ever got drunk? Yeah? <laughs> you did, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you had before, right? You, know, you, you, got, you got drunk and you cannot walk in a straight line, you know. You just wander. Wander, you waste your time and energy, and then you probably will fall, right? Fall and stumble, right? Um, stray is unable to walk straight. It's actually describing, you know, people who got drunk. But what, what it says is you stop listening to words of wisdom, even tough words, discipline. Then your life will be in ruin. Now, we often misunderstand spiritual growth in some sort of rosy picture. We always think, okay, how do you grow your relationship with God? Okay, how do you grow? Well, we're talking about uh, going to a retreat, right? To St. Louis, going to a retreat, you know, going, going, going somewhere else. And uh, probably there will be times uh, uh, we would do some, you know, <laughs> devotion, right? Quiet times. When you think of quiet times, uh, spiritual reflection, what, what, what kind of picture you have in mind? You probably have this kind of picture in mind, right? Oh, so nice, you know, you go to a, Go to a lakeside and uh, you just sit there and uh, open up your Bible and you know you turn to some of the passages that that uh, that 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 may be your favorite passages, right? Um, you don't want to turn to any passages that would yell at you, right? <laughs> that would that would discipline you. You don't turn to that, right? Because you know we we in the retreat, right? We want to feel nice. So oftentimes we think of spiritual growth or a spiritual relationship with God. In this sort of picture, I want to tell you today, this is a wrong picture. You raise it. It doesn't happen that way. Spiritual growth, your spiritual life, your character, it doesn't grow this way. This is a lie. It doesn't work that way. Now, think of spiritual growth not in this sort of picture. Think of spiritual growth in this picture. This is spiritual growth. 
This is character formation. This is spiritual formation. I remember years ago, I was in a region college in Vancouver, and I was taking MDiv, right? I prepared myself for, for ministry. And I have so many uh, classmates, um, other seminarians, they were taking the program of um, a spiritual theology, yeah, spiritual theology, or spiritual formation. I never heard of any one of those would talk about spiritual growth this way. I never. To sweat? I mean, to labor? I mean, to, to work hard? Right? Difficult? Being tough? I never heard of that. You know, kind of, I, I came out and, and, and I really have a big question. You know, how do you grow yourself? How do you, how do you grow in your character, in your spiritual life? They always think this way. Oh my God. Oh my God. I need to grow. Okay, I need to go away and to reflect, right? On the calm, you know, weather. It doesn't work that way, guys. I'm not saying there's no room for your spiritual growth to have some quiet times and spiritual for, uh, uh, reflection. We all do, right? We have 15 minutes a day, 10 minutes a day. Uh, it's, it's, it's necessary, but most of the time it's like this. The Bible is very clear to all of us, you know, and the spiritual teacher is showing us that character growth, spiritual formation requires hard work. There's no shortcut. If you forget about it, if you fold your arms, you, your life will be in ruin and your relationship with God will go down the pit. Spiritual growth requires sweat and tears by a hard-working farmer. Proverbs 1, 7. It says, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom, but fools despise knowledge and discipline. My child, my child, listen when your father corrects you. What you learn from them, from wisdom, will crown you with grace, and you will have honor. Now, how do you earn a life of wisdom and life of honor? You've got to listen. And listening is hard work. You've got to work against your own natural tendency, right? When someone w says some words of discipline, correction to me, you know, I, my, I don't have to work on it. I will naturally resist. Right? I will naturally resist. But you've got to work against that tendency, that sinful tendency, in order to get that honor, to grow your life and grow closer to God. To, so to all the fathers today, or soon to be father, I want to challenge you and want to remind you to grow in the way of wisdom. And that's going to be hard work. There's so much work in there, right? and uh, work hard to build a godly character. Because as father, I think fatherhood is the embodiment of spiritual wisdom. Um, and there's no excuse. There's no excuse for us to say, oh, no, I'm not a good Christian, you know, that's okay. You know, that sort of excuse will only lead to ruin and chaos and disorder. Do your best and run in the way of wisdom even though it will require you to work hard. And to all of you, to each and every one of you, I want to remind and challenge you to grow spiritually. And what I meant is not that rosy picture. No, 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 no. No, erase that. This one, I want to remind you, we need to work hard to build godly character, to build the community of God, to build the church. This is the picture. And that is the picture of honor. And that is the future of honor. So let's work, work on it and walk in the way of wisdom. Let's pray and we commit ourselves before the God of wisdom. It is his pleasing will, his pleasing desire for you and for me to grow in wisdom. Let's all pray. And I ask the team to come back up. 
Father, we come before you and humble ourselves. And may your spirit humble our hearts, knowing that we are sinful and we resist the word of wisdom. And I pray and I beg for, you with, uh, for your grace. I pray that you will change us and mold us so that we'll be teachable. Our spirit will, will be obeying to the voice of you. Speak the word of wisdom in our lives and grow us and mold us in the way of wisdom so that we can grow closer and closer to you. Perhaps we need to get back to reading your word and just work hard on understanding your word. Help us, Father. Perhaps we need to get on our knees to pray, to pray that we will grow in holiness, grow in godliness, and to humble ourselves bef before you and acknowledge that you are our God. So I pray that you will continue to help us to grow, even though it will take hard work. We will not be lazy. We will cling to your mercy and to grow spiritually and wisely so that your name will be honored in our lives. In Christ's name, pray.